Hi guys, welcome to another episode today, uh, Crowd Work Part 3. We've got a, a legend in Melbourne comedy, uh, one, of the, one of the best people in the scene to help uh, anyone, gives great advice. I would say the godfather of uh, the Melbourne open mic scene. If you need help, you go to, go to Fuemo, he'll fix you up. And yeah, Fuemo, Fuemo, how are you? Good, brother. How are you doing? You groovy? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. We, we literally just had a start of this just before and we didn't know, Justin didn't know uh, we were recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's was, start, I had to put my pants back on and everything was bullshit. <laughs> it was number one bullshit. <laughs> oh, <cool. man. laughs> so... Um, Justin has uh, just start. Uh, oh, I'll call you Flemo. That's what we call you. Flemo yeah. um, has been in the open mic scene. How long have you been doing it for? Uh, seven years, I think. But I, <laughs> I've been on stage most of my life. So I guess in music, when I was a singer, singing with Pegasus, I was always funny. So I kind of had a bit of a leg up and had a control. I definitely knew how to control an audience. Um, yeah. and commanded an audience and all that stuff. Um, but, yeah, I think it's been seven years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I used to smoke a lot of dope, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> so you do, you do um, when I first saw you, you predominantly did crowd work. Like you absolutely smashed it. Every time I saw you and you were out, you'd go and I'd see you a couple of times at the uh, comics lounge and you did crowd work every single time. What would you say crowd work is? Um, well, there's different types. There's um, authentic and inauthentic. I'd break it down to that. Uh, there's pre-writing your crowd work, having it scripted and setting up people with a, oh, so what do you do for a job? Oh, blah, 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 and make it sound like you're coming up with it, which I hate. I think that's hacky. It's all right if you've got a few, you know, someone says something, you've already got something for it, throw it out there. But I'm not cool with that. I really hate that and I don't like it. I think it's pretty hacky um, because I think everyone has the capability to tap into being authentic and that's being the real you and being in the moment. And when you're in the moment doing crowd work, it's like that's why I was, unfortunately, I was hooked into it. I, I did crowd work every gig for a good year and a half. And I'd do one joke at the end because I thought, oh, yeah, you probably need to hear a joke. And they're like, haven't we been here? <laughs> like, no, I just literally come up with everything you've heard tonight. Um, because it's, a, it's an electricity. It, when you're doing it and you don't know what's coming out of your mouth, mm. it, the reward when stuff comes up is, is amazing. It, there's nothing like it. It's electric. Um, if you pre-write it, you might win. But yeah. You'll hear the same crowd work every gig from the same comedian. It's a ugh, yuck. Do some work. Risk something. Yeah. You know, if you risk it, and that's that's what it is for me. I'm dancing on a razor's edge. And at the lounge when I was, you know, say a good one, two hundred gigs here where it was pretty much all crowd work, I'm dancing on a razor's, razor's edge and they know it. When they know I don't know what the hell is about to fly out of this. It sets a tension in the room. It puts an energy like, oh, we're into something special here. Then when you ask a question and the answer just comes from somewhere and it's unedited and unfiltered, you get away with it. But two, because you've, they know that you're in the moment, the laughter is even bigger because of the tension that you've built and everyone's in on it. Everyone's in on it. That's what I think crowd work is. It's being really authentic and risking it. Okay, if you bomb, who cares? You're not going to – you can't go through comedy winning every gig. If you are, you're probably a hack. You're probably cheating. If, if you're losing but you're trying, you're going to grow. You're going you're gonna to find your greatness, I think. Yeah. yeah I, guess, I guess it's relatable to everyone inside the room. It doesn't have like a – unrelatability uh, in, in a simple joke. Like when you're going out and doing a joke, it might 
hit really well with these people. But when yeah. you're doing crowd work, it's everyone because it's it's live. It's about them. It's it's in there, yeah, and it's universal. I guess you to whatever you know. If I'm in America or whatever, I was doing really well with crowd work there. I ended up having to lean on a, a bit of crowd work, um, but it's in the room. And I'm addressing people and things and voices and faces and things like that. So yeah, it's everyone's in on the joke, like you say. Yeah, would you would you say you're uh, like a, a quick fire type of um, uh, crowd worker? We ask quick questions one after another, or do you, would you say you're more of the you hold on to it and try and riff with whatever they're saying? Um, it all varies. I don't pre-plan so. On the night, you know, I might um, I might be just person to person, like literally walk in the front of the stage. What's your name? What do you do? Boom, boom, boom. Where'd you two meet? Boom, boom. What are you about you two? Where'd you two meet? Boom, yeah. boom, 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 boom. And it can end up being that way. And most, half the time the crowd also think that's your set. Like yeah. You've written a set. Other times they're all like, they know, like, wow, you literally come up with all that off the top of your head. And even people that do plan crowd work, that's their thing is that the crowd think that they're coming up with it off the top of their head where they're setting you up so they can tell their joke. Cool, I yeah. just need you to answer so I can start speaking again. They're not present. Yeah. They're not in – they're not connected to the audience. That That is another thing when you – because I'm at the lounge now, so I'm looking in the room. Um, when you're connected to the audience, I'm connected to – that's why I like the lights. I can see the audience's eyes. I hate the bright light mm. where I can't see anyone. It, it, I can't feel a connection. But if I can see your eyes, I can ask, I can have a conversation with you and then answer you. Yeah. And yeah, that's why, that's why probably like um, crowd works, works better in some rooms than it does in other ones. Like Voltaire, yeah. the light's straight in your eyes. You can't see anything. But at an apartment, it's, there's no spotlight. So you're yeah. literally everything down the open. You can, you know, roast people walking past. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I've, I've done it. yeah that no, that's true. Like um, death or glory, like the, the lights just boom, and yes. I, I have good gigs, like really good sets there. But the crap, it's. I think I was work. I haven't done that place for a while, but I was working more on material there, whereas. Other places lean to it, like um, the apartment has a vibe of I want to do crowd work. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of like that's why you go. Like you, you want to feel, I don't, know, I don't know, just part of the bar. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that place has, and the guys running it, like there's a really good vibe around that that gig. Um, but yeah, you you want to, um, I guess with you want to connect with people and, and there's also some gigs and I learned this in LA at the comedy store there that there's certain, and people make this mistake and a laugh. They go up there and there's two people there and they're like, Oh, what's the deal with, you know, fat zombies? Well, I was walking at the office the other day. And so you can't just do that. It <laughs> sounds stupid. Like why are you acting to them? You just, there's nothing you can do when you're at the comedy store and it's midnight and there's two people there. You have to just go, Hey, what's the deal with you two? Blah, 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 and, and make it conversational. Like you might be working on something. Go, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, how TV commercials go a lot longer than they used to. Blah, 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 blah. You notice that? Like, what's your favorite? And you just have a conversation and make two people laugh. Mm. If you can do that, then you can make four or five or six. Then you can make a crowd, a whole room laugh without material. Yeah, I, I was uh, just speaking with Ian earlier and he said he did a, uh, like, 12,000 people. Um, he did a, I think, I think it was a theatre, and he said he broke them up into different sections. He's like, oh, those are the rich people, those are the poor yep. people, and he was able to do crowd work even with that many people. Um in a in one of those settings, like twelve thousand people is a lot of people, and to still yeah. have more intimate in that way is is incredible. 
Yeah, that's a smart way to do it. And I, I've done similar things when I was in music, so I'd have big crowds um, where I'd get the crowd to chant certain things, but you pit them off against each other. So be yeah. like, oh, okay, these guys are a bunch of losers. You guys are, just scream this, boom, and, I'd, and it would make it fun and fun. Even though I was heavy metal, I couldn't be that. Like when I talked to the audience, I was never, are you ready to rock? I was like. Hey, what's going on, dickheads? <laughs> I'm standing here in a leather outfit with a blonde mohawk and I've got gauntlets on. I can't be serious, can I? <laughs> I tried it in the first gig back back when I was like 19, 18 or something. And I, are you ready to rock? And I was just like, that doesn't work. All right, there you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, theatres are a different... I've only done one comedy as far as comedy goes that was supporting Akmal last year maybe I don't even know what year it is uh, in Darwin at the Entertainment Centre and and that was a different vibe I did uh, two sets because I was emceeing um, and I did crowd work there um, yeah. but it was different it definitely was different it worked but it was different yeah, you're you're a really good comedian at um at having a good uh you're like fully rounded. You've got very good jokes that are well written, and you can do that type of gig. And then you've also got the ability to improvise um, off off the crowd and off off the way, uh, you know, just just off anything. Uh, what made you go into that type of style, like to be fully rounded? Why did you choose to? Oh. I always wanted to, so I always wanted, like with comedy, I just want to be the best I can be at it. And in everything I've ever done, I've always thought, have as many str strings to the bow as you can. Mm. So if you just one style, you're stuck in that one style. Um, yeah, I don't think it's a, it's just a time thing. Like you want to be great when you start. And you want everything to come to you before you're even ready in comedy. Uh, and like anything in music, I was the same. Um, but it just happens. You know, crowd work was a fear, and I'm sure it is with a lot of comedians, even professional comedians, like bigger ones than me or more experienced ones than me, don't do real crowd work. It's all yeah. set up because they're yeah. scared. They're scared of, oh, wow. But I got comfortable being comfortable, but I got comfortable being uncomfortable and comfortable really connecting with people, having a conversation with a human, being able to make them laugh at the bar. It's no different. Yeah. You know, and all I'm doing is making them laugh there. And if I can make them laugh in front of me, I'll make everyone else laugh. Um, one thing I, I just learned that, one year jokes have got to be good. So for the first few years, I, I've i got that charisma. Like well, I can walk onto a stage and get them before I get to the mic. That's just from the music world that I always had that. And that's how I, why I was in the music world. Because I wasn't a great singer to start with, but I got good. But And I'd say, why am I in the band? They're like, because you've got it. You can walk out there and the crowd are staring at you waiting Mm. You can't teach someone that. But I was mindful of that. So when I come into comedy, I was getting away with murder up there because I was very crass. I, you know, a lot of young comics make this mistake. They get up there and they say stuff that they think they're being like their idols. They're saying what they think they're hearing. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bill Burr comes out and says this or Stanhope says this. But no, you're just saying it in the most blunt, crass way. There's actually a, they're not saying those words. You're just hearing those words. Well, uh -huh. that, that stop. That's where a lot of people, and I was the same. I'd just get up there and like, my first joke, my first set in comedy was at the SP for Raw and I got heckled by the MC. Wow. She literally stood up and slammed the table and screamed, oh my God. <laughs> and the whole place just stopped and looked at her. And I'm like, <laughs> anyway, I was licking and I just kept going like, okay. It was 
Craspy. <laughs> but it was funny. It was funny. It was just, if I had the right audience, like a Rodney Root, an 80s audience, that's the problem. I grew up on 80s and 90s comedy and even earlier comedy, I guess, um, where it was a bit, wasn't as crafted, you know. Yeah. Um, so what I, because I remember when I started here, they were saying, man, you're going to have to tone it right down and clean up or you're not going to ever make any money um, in comedy. you got to go. Clean. And I was, and it pissed me off. It got me offended. Like, no, you don't tell me what to do. No one tells me what to do. I'll do what the what I think's fucking funny and that's it. That's all that matters. So I didn't back off and I've never backed off. Um, but what I have learned is how to say it right, how to express what I want in the right way that I get away with it. Yeah. And I, I get away with murder. Like you've seen some of the, some of the stuff I do. <laughs> if someone else was doing that, they'd get pulled up or called right. out. Whereas people are like, ah, we can't, he's, he's kind of innocent. Yeah. You, you, you have did this thing and we, we don't know how you did it, but. Uh, we were at vault, and you you came down to the vault, and everyone bombed. There were these two. Where's was, vault? Uh, in Yarraville. Oh there yeah, these, yeah, yeah. There were these two lesbians in the front, and we all bombed. And then you came <laughs> out, and they were heckling everyone. They were just fucking destroying everyone. And you came out, and you like made them laugh. And, but you were just, you were so subtle in the way you were asking questions. Uh, I think there was a uh, genuinity of, of asking the question and they responded um, and then you made it laugh and, that, and then you automatically had them, you captivated them and then you got off stage and they asked for you to come back. <laughs> and I <You're> did. Like, <laughs> I ran off yeah. to get... You're like, my room is waiting. I got to go. <laughs> I've got to go to Richmond and get some dope. <laughs> and then I come back and go, my deal is running late. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ran back on. Yeah, what I did there, and that was a learning experience for me because that was one of those gigs where you're like, Shit, I do not want to go up. Everyone's bombing and these women were just, they were vile, those chicks, that table. They were just attacking everyone. <laughs> and, and in that arrogance of, no, I know what's funny. And whatever I think, and and the whole room, which you'll notice, were looking at their approval. Yeah. So once they said he's okay, we think he's funny. Everyone else went, oh, okay, we think he's funny. What I did with them, I love this. Is one of my favourite things I ever do was they were trying to heckle me, but I was out heckling them. I was heckling them before while they were heckling me. Uh huh. So explain that. She, yeah. What she was doing was she was like. Because I, I hit a fancy thing and she was like, up, 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 about trying to say something like, you can't say that. And as she was going, up, 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 I'll go, my God, you've got beautiful eyes. Have you got, has she got beautiful eyes? Do you tell her she's got beautiful eyes? My God, you're a lucky woman. Anywho, so I started fisting this woman, right? And, blah, 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 and then she'd go, up, 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 up. And I'll be like, oh, my God. And your voice. Are you a singer? My God. Yeah, that's where I went something like, because she had that real lesbian like, Rrr! she kept doing that. When she's getting angry, and I'm like, okay, you got a voice like Rita Franklin. Is she a good singer? Don't be, I, no, 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 you're just being humble. Blah, 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 blah. So, no matter wherever she went after me, I kept complimenting her. <laughs> so, and she's just like, oh, I guess I am a good singer. And that's, I started singing my jokes or something to her. Yeah. yeah. And I out heckled the heckler. That was the gig where I out heckled the hecklers. <laughs> It yeah, was that like, was the trick in that one. You went. You said to her. Um, I still remember it. Um, he said, uh, "He goes, oh, you guys are lesbians, huh?" You're like, uh, "Was there a lot of team sports when you were growing up?" You play a team. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of softball in that family. <laughs> <laughs> it was so fucking good, man. You were able to just quell um, uh, a rowdy uh, couple, which. Um, essentially have the moral like in society like current people like hating hating um whatever they've got the moral high ground on top of you like they see you as a, a, a white, white male and they're like oh you know you can't be saying that and 
you we're lesbians, blah blah blah. You can't make lesbian jokes, and you're like, all right, all right. <laughs> really? You want to say I can't do something? <laughs> and I, I don't. That's the thing. I don't care if I bomb. It's like, oh, you told me not to. St- oh, I can't fuck a midget. <laughs> Bitch, please. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> But you've got that. Um, I don't know if you watched the uh, the Michael uh, Jordan uh, last dance thing. No, I haven't watched it yet. I've been I've been meaning to. Yeah, I'm so still jerking off the Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> Can you ask it? <laughs> so Michael Jordan, he goes, uh, he goes. You know what? I don't want, I don't want Nike. Uh, I don't want because he, he signed a deal with Nike, and he won the Olympics with uh, Reebok. And he goes, I'm not going to wear the Reebok logo because I'm with Nike because I'm not going to show it. So what he does, um, they're like, uh, Reebok's like, you have to wear it or else you're not going to get the medal. You don't want to pick up the medal. So what he does is he gets a American flag and he puts it over his shoulder but on top of the Reebok logo. Nice. And so, so I'm thinking, like, that, like I'm using that analogy to it's the way you're doing um, crowd work. You're you're doing what you want to do, but you're doing it softly, and you don't go over like you don't offend them. Yeah, it. it I had to work on that. You know, like I said, I was pretty full on, and I've, I've never really got many complaints or anything. Um, when I was on tour with Akmal, supporting him, I noticed one, one thing that I was getting two types of people particularly coming up for photos after gigs. Um, most of those gigs went good. Uh, it was dudes with their ta- tattoos on their neck. They cut like that. Bit of See meth that, up on their cheek. <laughs> You're loose. You're <laughs> loose, bro. People would love that. Obviously, I'm loose as. Uh, and mums, like older women would come up and they'd be like, I did not appreciate what you said there. That was really naughty. Blah, blah, blah. And they'd sort of have a go at me, but they go, can I get a photo with you? Yeah. It's like, wow, it's really weird that that's the two in particular. Like people had a good time, but they were wanting photos. And I, I don't get that at the lounge a lot where older women would want photos. And I put it down to, I'm very analytical, that, I'm their son's best mate, the one that they get up on a Saturday morning, they go to the kitchen and I'm already in the kitchen eating Cocoa Pops. Yeah, I let myself in. How you going? Because <laughs> I'm like that. I was always like that. I'd always end up in other fam, like with the lounge. I'm like part of the fam. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've let myself in. Um, and I think they're like, oh, you're that cheeky little boy from down the road. We... Mm. Yeah, your heart's in the right place. You know, you're not yeah. doing this ma- ma- uh, maliciously or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I definitely, <clears throat> I think with my writing, once I come up with something and I start working on something, there's a way. Um, actually, it is quite deliberate. So the midget one, and all a lot of that set, the reality TV stuff. Um, how, how can I fuck a midget on stage and not get in trouble? How do I do that? <laughs> so then, and that's how I look at it. Like, how can I do this and not get in trouble? And that's my personality growing up. I would always run up like I was sent to a reform school and shit like that. And my principal, I remember he grabbed me by the throat one day just because that's what it was like. He just started strangling me in a, you know, behind a door and he said, you know why I hate you so much? It's because you know where the line is and you run up to it and you fucking stop. You don't step over it so I can't kill you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's probably a fucking good thing. Because we had, they were allowed, it was the only school in Australia where they were allowed to hit you with a, a pipe. They had a pipe called Uncle Bob. <laughs> and I'd, I'd get other kids, I'd make other kids fuck up so they'd get it so I can sit in the window and watch people get belted. <laughs> like, I set him up. 
Who tells the teacher to suck their dick? You idiot. It was your first day. <laughs> Wouldn't have fit in that bad. <laughs> You'd tell a teacher at, a, at the most notorious school in the country. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that's how I approach it. I look at, like, because I love that stuff. Like, you'll never get me doing boring elevator shit. And yeah. It's not my personality. It's not my way. So a lot of my stuff is I have to look at it and say, how do I get away with saying this but not where they can't touch me? And, I, yeah, I think I sort of do to a larger extent. Yeah. <laughs> do you think it's better to do uh, more, bit, uh, more gigs or better gigs? Hmm. I got to where I got because I had better gigs. I didn't do... Man, for my first four or five years, I was only doing one or two gigs a week. One, a lot of it was one gig, but it was here on a Tuesday and it was packed. Mm. Um, so, and I came from a place where I'm used to doing good gigs with the music, so, or being on bigger stages. So, what I would do is I knew I had the Tuesday. It was my show. I had 10 minutes. I could go longer if I wanted. Um, and there was a real audience. So when I started here, uh, we had the workshops and stuff. There'd be some nights, there'd be 10 people in here. It was horrible. And they would sit anywhere. <laughs> so there'd be three rows before you saw a face. And then there was someone up in the back corner four people in the other corner and two people over there. And that was your crowd. So you hit a joke and you get a. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Did that work? <laughs> Did it work? I don't know. Is that funny? Is it good enough? It was horrible, man. And so when I started it, the crowds went up because people were coming to see me, people I knew and people from the music world. Um, but still, it was bad. Then when I took it over, I did a big push that week. They were going to get rid of it. And I said, give it to me for a couple of weeks. Let me see what I can do. And the first week, it was 400 people. Yeah. But what I did was I stood at the door and I didn't allow anyone in. And then I stood at the, the entrance to the actual room and I said, okay, how many in your group? Two? Cool. Come with me. You sit here. You sit here. Yeah. And I jammed them in. So it was packed. So then when I walked on stage that night and I knew what I was doing, I go, ba ba da ba ba boom. I'm like, that worked. <laughs> All right, boom, that worked. You got a real answer. So from then on, I had years of that environment. So if I worked on stuff that was new, I knew every gig I was doing new stuff, trying new stuff or honing stuff. So I was doing the real hard work. And I also got the ability because of that to learn how to write for the room. So I'd write stuff and I'd be like, oh, that'll kill at the comics lounge. Oh, that'll kill in a club. And then it would. So I kind of got a heads up like that. But that gig doesn't exist now. So doing more gigs. The problem with more gigs is I see these a lot of these guys in Melbourne, the the other crowd who I don't class as proper comics, the inner city sort of lot, alternative lot, they'll do four gigs a night and eight, uh, 10 gigs a week or whatever. But yeah. if you see them, if I see them tonight and see them in three weeks, they're saying the same goddamn words or sentences without jokes mm. that they did three weeks ago. If yeah. you're doing four gigs a night, work, Unless it's ready to go and you're just working on timing and different things and just getting it out, yeah. that's fine. But if I'm on my way to another gig, ideally you're writing out, that, listening to it, going, that didn't, oh, that bombed. I said that so wrong. That came across really wrong. <laughs> Better fix yeah. that. They don't do that. There's no point doing heaps of gigs unless every gig you're attempting, you're risking it. That's why I say you can't bomb if you're doing something new. Mm. Okay, so if you've got a eight minute spot or a seven minute spot or whatever or five, start with your strong stuff. Try get them in your hands so you can work on your new stuff. Ideally, you do it like that, and 
chuck in the new stuff. And if it bombs, it bombs. If it kills, it kills. If it's got legs, it's got legs. But then when you get off stage and you did three minutes of new ideas or reworking ideas and it didn't work, you reworked them but they failed, well, you know that's not where you got to go. So you didn't fail. Yeah. If you get up to the next gig and say exactly the same crap that didn't work last night, well, you're failing. You're not a comic. You're just someone going on stage telling words. You, yeah. It, it yeah. should angst you. It should be, oh, God, I've got, why isn't this adding up? It's a puzzle. For me, it's pretty much a jigsaw puzzle. You've got to move things around until it, it looks good or it's pretty and then boom. Yeah. Yeah, so more gigs is great if you're doing the work gig to gig night to night you're getting up the next day you know everyone i'm pretty lazy so i haven't you know my you know i had a job when i started i was a private investigator and that didn't last long because i was like yeah i prefer to just work on my jokes all day yeah have money yeah these guys are cheating on you but i gotta set a <laughs> in 10 minutes i gotta go well i'd be writing jokes and then Cars would disappear while I'm writing a joke. I'd be like, oh, shit, where'd the car go? <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> I'd be burning around the streets looking for people. <laughs> like, oh, shit. <laughs> have to write in the report. Uh, I lost him through traffic. <laughs> Cheaters, more. Nice more and everything. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, um, yeah, so, so definitely if you're going to do a heap of gigs, make them worth it. Um, now I do a lot more gigs, especially back then too. The scene was very divided. So I was the comics lounge guy. I'd go to a gig and you've definitely experienced this where you go into some places and as soon as you get up there, they will fold their arms, the other comics, and they'll laugh at their mates' jokes and trick the audience like, yeah, he's funny, ha, doing all their fake laughing. Then when you get up, they cross their arms and then no matter what you do, they're not going to laugh. Um, and yeah. And what would happen was I'd go to those gigs and I'd get that vibe where I'd go to shake someone's hand and they'd ignore me. And I'd be like, we're part of a community here, you asshole. And also, you know what I could do to you all? <laughs> There's only 12 of you here. There's not enough of you here to stop me, <laughs> you assholes. My bouncer. <laughs> um, so I would go on stage already given up. And what would happen... And you're probably experiencing this, so remember this, is you go up there and you're like, oh, these are all assholes. They're folding their arm. They're not giving us stuff. They're being shit, blah, blah, blah. You're not going to try your hardest because if you go out there and go, here I am, and they give you nothing, you were vulnerable. And they got to shoot you down at your most vulnerable where you gave everything. So you just go up there like, oh, yeah, blah, blah, and you half deliver your jokes and you half invest it. Therefore, when they shoot you down, they didn't get to the real you. Yeah, yeah. If you understand that. So you've still got to go up there and just go, ah, oh, whatever, boom, and just be you. Be open and be as honest and and the best version of yourself. And I got, there was one uh, gig at Gorilla where the MC was one of them that when I started was not nice to me. Yeah. Um, you know, you... I'd go to a sign up, put your name in the hat for I think two months, and my name never got called out, but their best mates got called out. And then the last night I saw them pulling backstage, yeah. they were pulling names out, removing yeah. my name. I was like, you assholes, I've driven two hours to come to this gig. I've worked, I've been up since four following people and shit. Like I'm stuffed and why yeah. am I doing this? Yeah, that yeah, pushed yeah. me into this place. Um <clears throat> but I did this gig at Gorilla and the MC was one of them. The first act was one of them. And they were bombing so bad, the owner come downstairs. He goes, oh, he's got to go on next. <laughs> the people will leave. And I went up there and I was just, I just went mental. And watching them, clock, and I was trying not to laugh, but I was making them sort of, oh, that's funny. And it was a yeah. win. And then um, one of their, had their girlfriend there. And he was not given a thing, but she was next to him. And I hit, I tried a joke I'd written in America and I thought, oh, it's a bit hacky. I won't ever say it, but I just wrote it. And I threw it out there and beer come out of her nose. <laughs> and I was like, oh, awesome. 
oh, that's that's worth all this <laughs> bullshit you put me through all these years just to have your girlfriend have beer coming out of her nose. And I leaned, I leaned over and go, I know who she's thinking of tonight <laughs> and walked off stage. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've found... Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go. No, you go for it. Um, so, yeah, you've... I think a lot of it's about risk and being vulnerable. Like, you're a funny guy. You're naturally a funny, happy... And being that, not, oh, I've got to be this. Like, you've got to tap into the real you and somehow get in there. And it takes risk. It takes, ugh, a bombed, a bombed, a bombed. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to find the real me. And, yeah. And once, and I always knew I was funny. I always knew that. Like, and everyone always said, you should be a comedian since I was a kid. Um, and then when I got into comedy and posted a photo, say on stage or something, everyone's my timeline was just like, thank God, finally, boom, 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 about time. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, and then it took, yeah, it took a few years for that guy to get there. Uh -huh. But I had to learn how to write, you know, you've got to learn how to write jokes. It's about jokes. If they're not funny, they're not. It's not going to work. And what that allows you is once your jokes are actually good, you've got a good set, then you can jump off crowd work. Because if crowd work's not working, you just fall into a joke. Yeah. It sort of yeah. gives you that a little bit of confidence. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I spoke to Kyle. We had Kyle on, uh, Kyle Legacy. He, that dude does no material whatsoever. Yeah. And I thought I'd just say that, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh you were a big proponent of, uh, especially with me, uh, you told me that just to be free on stage and just be whoever you are, whatever it is you are, just be free, take that jump. And you said um, when you took that jump because you believed in yourself that you would always land on your feet. Yeah, I used to smoke a lot of drugs, so just to get that. <laughs> that resonated with yeah, you. I was lying. <laughs> nah. um, yeah, if, like I said, you're a funny person and you're yeah. a lovable, happy, like there's, you know, the big smile. Like, you know, that's really you. Yeah. When you can take that, and whenever it comes, it comes, but whenever you can take that guy, the essence of you onto a stage... <clears throat> your answers are going to, when you do crowd work, your answers are going to come out authentically and they're going to be funny and lovable and happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And you'll also write from that place. That's a big thing being in that state. I mean, I go into a, there's a state of being, so when I'm in that zone and you see my eyes go funny when I get on stage because it's like, boom, I'm here, I'm ready to go. There, there's definitely a state of being that I go into. So when I write jokes, if I'm in that state, I'll come up with killer material because that's the best me is going on stage in that state. And you might see me doing a really good set. If that same guy's here with a pen and paper, I'm going to come up with the same quality of joke because I'm in that weird, there, crazy place. With those videos that I've been doing, a big turning point there was they were very mundane. They were funny, but there was, I went and did one straight after a gig at the apartment and I, I got off stage. I went mental in this gig. Then when I got to the hotel, I was still in that. Yeah. And I pressed record and just da, 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 went crazy. And I captured the stage me on camera. Wow. And I was like, Oh, that's the trick. If I can bring the guy that can go on stage and go psycho, if I can bring him to the camera, then I've got gold or funny. It's going to be funny material. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that's one big thing. There is a state of being I'm learning about. Flow state. You know, you know. So your flow state. Yeah. Yeah. Flow state. Definitely. Yeah. I've definitely done some research on it and it helps. Um, there, I've, I've seen that there's some triggers online that help you get into it. And one of it um, is what you're talking about is risk. Risk gets you into flow state. It's yeah, a, it, I'd, I'd agree with that. So, yeah, I, but it also, that is a drug. 
because you're yeah. receiving yeah. the the most amount of adrenaline at that one time, and then you go out for that drug. It's like we're yeah, drug addicts. That, that's, <laughs> that's me. That's a hundred percent what is going on with me. And yeah. you've seen that say over the last couple of years, especially. I found that state um, yeah. in sport. I love in football. I and one thing I sort of black out, like I'd come off staging gigs and people go, that was great. I go, what did I say? Because I wouldn't have a clue what happened. <laughs> me too, me too. It was a blackout. And in football, I remember there was games where, especially the era where I was captain at Dandy, I would, um, I was the leader, I was the boss. I had to protect my boys. So I took it to another level. Um like there'd be games where like the first quarter I kicked four or five goals. I wouldn't even remember kicking them. <laughs> I'd just uh, be on like, oh, we gotta win this game. And I'd just go, give it to me, take the ball off my own teammates and run away with it and kick it. Goal. Like Yeah. Things yeah. that were just um that's and in music as well, when I write, I go into a state and I've got my techniques. It's a different, completely different technique, but yeah, if you can take that state where you're blacking out, try get there as much as you can and get used to it, get comfortable with it. It is a drug. That's like, I mean, I, I, I'm fortunate. I don't, I don't do five-minute spots anywhere usually. Um, but yeah. I'm in the state as well. And a lot of the venues go, oh, he's in the zone. Just let him go. Of course. Don't mess with him. Um, the value but, still. Well, that's the other thing that keeps, you know, I know also know where it's, you know, when I'm working on stuff in an open mic room, it's like, oh, I have to do a good set to make sure the audience stay. So yeah. for the next lot of comedians. So that also takes it out of your head where I'm doing it for other people, for my friends. Yeah. So like, okay, these people are going to leave. Hey, let me go off now. I'll go up next and I'll just boom, 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 make them laugh and they let it out and they start learning to laugh for the night and then the next act has a good gig. Uh, I learned that here, actually. If there was ever someone was bombing, like, like the first three or four acts, say Husey, like our biggest comedians might bomb because they're working on new material. The crowd are like, I'm like, this is my night. If they leave, I'm in trouble. So I'd have to go up there and lift it. Yeah. So then I'd go to the break with me and then people would stay because, it. oh, cool, we let it out. We forgot the first act. Yeah, um, yeah. It was little things like that. I got trained. I look at it now. I trained myself how to lift the show. Um, but the it wasn't about me looking good. Uh, mm -hmm. And I say that to a lot of you guys with MCing. When you MC, try this where you go up there and it's like, I'm and you just look at the other comedians and say, I'm going to have a really good set so my mates can have a really awesome show. Yeah. It's about yeah. them. It's and what will happen is by default, you're going to have a good set because you're selfless and you're not thinking about you. You're just doing it because you're protecting, looking after me, boys. Yeah, that's, that's more like a captain mentality. Yeah, yeah. It And rarely has that ever failed. I, I see that as a really powerful tool. Think about the other people, not you. Not the crowd. Think about your mates. They're yeah. going to have that killer show because I set it up for them. And I don't care if I look good. I don't care because you're doing your work. You're like, yeah. I'm working on things here. I'm learning how to be a better MC. Once you get good at MC and then your MC, you're getting more time on stage than everyone else in, in a smaller gig anyway. You know, you know, sometimes I feel like um, I'm being a bit selfish when I do crowd work. No, when I'm not doing crowd work. When I'm not doing crowd work, because I know I can get laughs from it, and if I don't do it, I know it's not going to uh, improve the night. Like, I know I'm like, like, if I'm doing my written material, it feels like it's, it's a 50-50. It might work, it might not work. So if I... If I because crowd work elevates the audience immensely, I, I genuinely feel selfish when I'm uh, not doing it. Yeah. Um, it's, I know what you mean there. I've had that way. I've yeah. killed with crowd work years ago and I'd fall back into my material now and I was like, oh, fuck yeah, I better go back to crowd work. 
was a massive drop off. The last yeah. quality was a drop off. Yeah. Um, going into material. Um, the, that's a flow state. That's like I say, when you're doing welling crowd work, go into your material, but take that same state, make sure you're recording it because. And don't be rigid in the words you got to say. Like this would help you where you've got a bit, say your Anzac bit, for example, you're doing your crowd work and it's killing, then fall in the Anzac bit light, be really light. So it's not what you've pre-written. Just mm. go, I'm going to go this way, but I'm already in, I'm in that state. Yeah. And you yeah. might find your gold. You might, it might find its way through the, the rigid path. So, um, yeah. But no, I definitely had that same thing. You go back to normal material and you're like, oh my God, my normal material sucks. <laughs> oh, I still do that. Like I've got hundreds of gigs I haven't listened to, probably three, 400. And I was listening to them last year. I was trying to go backwards through them all. And because I did say there was probably 200 gigs of crowd work and I'm like, oh, there's got to be gold in there. Yeah. And I'm laughing at it myself, going, oh, that's because I can't remember it. And I'm pissing myself laughing at the shit I'm coming up with. But it's like, that can never be a joke. Because yeah, no yeah. girl, when am I, there was one Turkish girl um, <laughs> and her friend who was Lebo. And her name was, um, Ber, oh, not Beretta, something like that. And I've gone, what's your brother's name? It's fucking 12 gauge and brass knuckles. Like, I can't remember. Her name was something that was along that line. Yeah, yeah. And I just riffed on it for ages, just boom, boom. And I was punching the audience's head in. And then I was laughing. I thought, oh, that's awesome. But then I got the pen. And I'm like, I can never use any of that. And a lot yeah. of the gigs, I got nothing from it. And that's when I stopped doing crowd work. Mm. Around last, that gig at the vault, that's when I stopped. After that, no, I stopped doing crowd work as much because it was like, I've got no material. Like I do, but I should be writing new material and growing in that that sense. So I went back to writing jokes and struggled, you know, for a while. I guess with my process, it comes from, I kind of feel like it comes from somewhere else and falls into your lap. Mm. I don't come up with it. Yeah, so how do you uh, start writing after you've, like, after you've shown that you're a great crowd worker, after you know that, okay, I'm funny, how do you go to, to write? Um, well, I remember what happened. I got the book, so it was New Year's Eve and I hadn't written for a couple of weeks and I was like, oh, God, I've got to write jokes, like, I've got to go back to writing jokes. And then New Year's, the fireworks started, and I was sitting in the van smoking dope. And um, that's the other thing, not judging it, just writing a joke. Well, that's a joke. It's not great. I'd never say it. I think I did say this one a few times. The fireworks went off, and I thought about, you know, all, everyone's dogs and cats are going, you could hear dogs barking. And, you know, they say you've got to lock them up because they'll jump the fence and run away. And I thought, what about all the homeless people? Have they got up, jumped and ran away and found homes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. But, but it was like, oh, cool. I'm thinking funny again. Oh, cool. And then it led into more joke. And I don't think I wrote anything good for a couple of months. You know, mm. what I deem, I've got a high, what I think is a high standard for me. Um, and also... Um, so say with that midget joke, that one I wrote in LA a couple of years earlier. Mm. I saw the billboard for their show, the TV show, yeah. Little Women of LA. The original joke was this, that there's all these little midgets <laughs> and they're posing on their limos and all this on the huge billboard, which is that big for midgets. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, and their husbands are behind them and they're normal size and they've all got creepy looks. And I'm like, fuck, if I work for the FBI, I'd be checking their Google history. <laughs> and that's all the joke was. And it somehow I think revisiting 
like writing down everything and then going back through it, um, putting it in Word, pro, you know, Word spreadsheet, and just keeping yeah. stuff there and going back because you've got jokes now that you know will be horrible, but in four years' time, you've got the tools in your toolbox. Yeah. Yeah, to build them into something good, and that's the same thing with me. Four four years ago, my toolbox was completely different. I didn't have as many tools in it. Now I've got better quality tools. I've got better tool. I've got more tools, um, and I can turn a joke into something funny really fast, or might take time, but enjoy the process of of crafting it. Yeah, and, um, you know, um, in music, I sort of. I would get into a state when I write and I, I believed that I didn't write the songs. They were already written in music. I always have this theory that songs are already written and all it is, is I'd play the guitar and I'd just get myself into a zone, into a frequency where I'd tune into a certain music. I'd sort of picture it this way. Cool. I'm in this certain frequency then the song would come down to me. And then I'd write it out. Sounds a bit hippie, airy, fairy, but I guess comedy is a bit the same because if I look at people ask, how'd you write certain jokes? I'm like, I can't even, I have no idea. Yeah. It just fell out of my face. So I tuned into a frequency. The joke's already written. I was just the one that tuned to it. And, yeah. and I believe that too because I've got a very, I've got a style like a type of joke, like I always go there. I'm always on the edge of the cliff going, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, care. Yeah. Like I'm right at the edge all the time pushing it. Yeah. So I attract that same type of joke and that same level of laughter and that same level of offence yes. pushing yeah. it, Yeah. if you know what I mean. So yeah. that's one way to look at it, I think. Uh, but then I've also shown you the joke mining, like I'll do a lot of that, so... <clears throat> some jokes just fall out and they're great. Uh, not much work's needed. They just naturally fall out and I'll go on stage and just work them night after night until it happens. Other ones I'll be more clinical and I'll sit down and I'll joke mine them. Um, so with the reality TV stuff, some of the subjects I just wrote out, you know, um, uh, MasterChef, or what is it? Farmer Wants a Wife, say. Uh, everything about farms, everything about wives, everything about farmers, everything. What's the opposite? What about gamer wants a wife? Okay, everything about gamers. Okay, uh, the interview is not with him; it's with his mother saying, "Can you please get this fucker out of my basement?" Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Just what if? Yeah, Just yeah. Hitting every element and then looking at the the spreadsheet with every every word written on it, mm. and and match and words will trigger. We go, oh, that and that. Oh, Connect. that'd be funny. Blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. Like with the, my brother joke about him being a cricketer and playing for Australia and me doing the porno. Written. Perfectly written. You know, he's got red balls. I've got blue balls. No one cheered for me when I had a bat. Um, he doesn't know the pain of getting caught behind yeah. on the, in yeah. the workplace or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, certain words match. So, you know, it's... The big thing, too, is having fun with it. You know, comedy, I've certainly done this where I've taken it too serious and it's become too... Like a, it's like, how am I going to write a joke where I'm so serious about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be an idiot. Be playful. You know, and you guys have helped me out a lot, like you younger guys. That's why, like, I, I didn't do open mic for years. And, I, and I'm grateful that there's guys like you and Huey and... Alessio, um, Paulie, like just people where it's like, cool, I, I want to go to your, I want to go there because I want to see yeah. you guys. Yeah. You know, I didn't have that when I started. It was, it was really a horrible vibe. It was really unfriendly. Um, now I want to go there and I enjoy, like when I look over and you guys are pissing yourselves, losing it, I'm like, cool, you know. It's yeah. made open mic. I don't think, oh, I'm up here and I'm too good for open mic. But there was a point where I did think that. I thought, oh, I don't do open mic. And now it's like, hey, I can't wait to do open mic because I get to see people that are good people. And you guys put me into a good mood and a Thanks. good vibe. So, like, 
I go up there and I can have a better gig because I'm in a better place, you know. Yeah, definitely it helps a lot easier. Um, it helps. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, and, and, yeah. Yeah. Also, one thing: just read as much. As, um, I try to read books on comedy. It doesn't help. Maybe a few little things will help me. Um, but for me, like I've gone back to acting. Um, and people have noticed that um, with a lot of gigs that are like, leading up before this shit hit the fan, the end of last year gigs where people were like, wow, you're completely different. Um, so for my style, going back to acting and working on my acting skills and getting back into that has totally transformed my comedy mm. and my stage presence. Um, so yeah. just do a little bit of everything, learn everything. That's what makes you well-rounded. I'm a one-liner, storyteller, offensive, can be yeah. clean occasionally, can be angry, can be sad. I'm a little bit of everything, and I am that in real life. So yeah, just yeah, get good at them all. Yeah, well, yeah I, think the, I think the best thing, um, well, I, I, I heard this from someone else, the best thing that I've done is, is whenever I get to a gig, um, I don't know, I just like shaking everyone's hand. And I think I learned that from uh, sports. I just go there and I shake everyone's hand. And yeah. I started doing that and then the queue and that and everyone started doing that. So when you see everyone, it's either a, a handshake or a hug or there's just some sort of camaraderie that happens. Um, even though, like, I stole the idea, really, handshaking. It's not, it's not original. <laughs> yeah, some, some guy from the 30th century is rolling over in his grave. His asshole stole my damn terms. <laughs> but, um, like, uh, it, how much it, it makes such a big difference, especially, like, if you look at uh, soccer teams um, in the country. Well, I played for a country soccer team. When we rocked up there, no one shook anyone's hand. And I went and I shook everyone's hand. And the same thing happened when I came to comedy. I was there. I was doing that. But the same doesn't apply for footy teams. Footy teams have come out and everyone's a great unit. And they're all there to help each other. And they're all fucking, I don't know, doing drugs together, hanging out, being a good uh, just environment to be in. And that's what makes it a better it just makes the end goal a lot better, and it makes the um, it makes the people work as a team, and yeah. and that's that that's what you think of. You think of your your mates. You think about the lineup. You think about um, okay, well you know this person's new, so we'll put someone good uh, after him to to improve it. And that mentality of it being a community comes into stage, and. I, yeah, I, I, I love communities about, you know, like the comedy community. We, we would be so much better if we were all, um, you know, just helping each other out. But there's yeah. not many. There's not many. There's you. There's no one else, really, that we can turn to. And Yeah, we, there's a lot that won't want to. Um, when I ran the workshops here, so I'd have a pro running it every week and then they'd MC. So after you'd done the workshop, you could watch them. But, the man, there was quite a few where I'd say, oh, would you run the workshop next week? You know, the younger comedians would love to hear from you. And they go, why the fuck would I help them? You're going to take my jobs in a couple of years. Fuck those cunts. And I'd be just like, whoa. Yeah. Ugh. And they're big comedians. Like, they're ones who are on TV and different things like that. And it's like, oh, your shit just... Give back as much, you know. Yeah. I, just thinking now, there was a point a couple of years ago where I thought I've got to give back as much as I, I can and help. When I went to America last time, it was to um, learn how, it, like in Denver, I got to Denver when I got the email that they were shutting my show down here and uh, giving it to someone else. Um, but I went there to learn from the, com uh, the comedy works there how because what they do they got their workshop and then they've got comedian like say me i'm going on tour i've got to pick three acts so it's like cool and i'm helping you learn then on the next tour you're the mc then you're teaching 
So there was a definite thing um, giving back. I think it's just really good. If I can make the scene better, then yeah. I've got to lift my game as well. If I'm a, if you know, there's no point being a big fish in a little pond. If you make the pond yeah. bigger, the quality yeah. better, then you're get, constantly getting pushed and lifting your game. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I, like, just I don't know, I don't know um, half half the stuff uh, a pro would know. Like someone at the top, I don't know half the stuff. I'm I'm in no position to give out advice, but. Sometimes you don't need advice. Sometimes you just need a, you know, someone there to just, I don't know, talk to, or someone there to just, you know, uh, just talk about your set. It's it's not really necessarily to be a, a, a big fucking act. It's it's just about human decency, and it, it's lacking in our fucking, you know, in our scene. Yeah, it is. People want to be famous. That's the problem with false celebrity and. You know, there's a lot of people that are in comedy to get a TV show or a radio show. They, they don't yeah, care about yeah. stand-up. Um, it's a very selfish... Of course, you know, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of selfish people, and that's... You know, I don't mind, but just don't come to my gigs. <laughs> I don't want to be around those people. Ugh. Um, <laughs> yeah. The other thing, a big thing I think I remember and I'm aware of is where younger comedians just want a thumbs up, just going, you're on the right path. Yeah. I remember that. And I started doing that a, a few years ago where I pull someone aside, I'd send them a Facebook message after a gig. And I just go, I'm really proud of what you did tonight, man. Yeah. Yeah. You handled yourself really well. And I'd get a message back like, Oh, you've just made my night, blah, blah, blah. My train ride home is going to be that much better. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, what it is is I do remember people would ask, oh, am I killing it? Blah, blah, blah. But what they really want is, am I on the right path? Yeah. Because you don't know. You don't know. Am I going the right way? Because there is nowhere yeah. to go in comedy. You're like, well, I can work towards doing a festival show, but anyone on the street can do a festival show. Yeah, You don't sure. have to have a quality control. So anyone can do that. Um, I don't know... We, we don't know where we're going. Even me, I'm like, all I, all I can work on, and there was also where a penny dropped a few years ago. I was really distraught, like, felt like, you know, I lost my show here. Um, a lot of people had turned their back, and I was like, or you find out you've been used. And I, I thought the only thing I can control is how good I can get and how good I am and can I get better at it and, that's that's all I can control. Last year was about being unfollowable, if I want to be. Um, yeah. I, I had a mindset of, cool, if no one can follow me, I've got to be the headliner. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. You know? And in a lot of the gigs, I don't go that hard where no one can follow me because um, that'd be a shit thing to do. But just going, cool, well, we've... If I want to, I can put the pedal to the metal and finish the night now. Uh -huh. But yeah. not, never doing that. I don't think I've done that to anyone. Um, yeah. But, yeah, that, that's, that was just my mindset. Like, okay, opportunities are not coming now. So all I can do is just work on me and get as good as I can, read as much as I can, write as much as I can, practice as much as I can, um, be as critical of myself as I can. Mm. Um, yeah, not pat myself on the back where it's un unworthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you What do you think of the um, the the Melbourne Comedy Festival? I uh, hate it. I hate it. That's why I've never done it. <laughs> For the first few years, I was um, <sighs> I was like, well, I'm not going to do it until I'm good enough. Yeah, and. Um, even a few years ago, people were going, you're good enough. You should be doing a show. Like, people will come and see you. Um, even at, well, when I was with Akmal, when I caught up with him last or whatever, he's still going, man, you've got to do a show about being in porn. Like, people will come, you know. Mm. And I'm like, I don't find anything funny about it. Like, I've got some jokes about it, but 
that whole thing of writing a story out, and, you know, it, yeah, I think Melbourne, the problem with Melbourne Festival is anybody can come here, you can pay your $600 and you can put on a show, whether you're good, bad or anything. Um, it's cura- like, and then to get into one of their rooms, you've got to be in with their crowd. And then you've got the festival club and you've got to be in with certain people to get on there. So yeah. then you can get on ABC. And it's like, well, none of your acts could follow me. Yeah. Am I going to get on? No. Yeah. It's not about the best comedians. It's not about value for money. It's certainly not about the audiences. You know, I don't think, you know, I just don't think there's 600 shows. I really think there should be 60. There should be 60 shows on because then them 60 comedians are going to make their money. One, the audience are not going to leave and go, I'm never, like, could you imagine three, you you and your partner go, all right, honey, we're going to three shows. You pick three shows and they're three open micers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all, even some pros that are not pros, but they're pros here. Well, you're not going to go back next year, are you? Because you got burnt last year. Two years later, you go, you know, let's give it a go again. You go back and you get another one because their poster was better. You're like, oh, my God. And that's the problem. It's bad for stand-up comedy. And the other thing is what the festival pushes and this scene pushes is a type of comedy that they want you to be into. Yeah, they've marketed the specific type of comedy. Yep, and it might not be good comedy, but it's politically correct or it's got an yep. agenda behind it or it's like with Raw. If you open with, hey, I'm a, fe- I'm a male feminist, oh, they go, Ooh, let's listen to him. Yeah. My last Raw set that I did, I walked on stage, the judges got up and walked out. They didn't even listen to my set. <laughs> and I heckled them as they walked past. Got, I haven't even told a joke yet and you're leaving. <laughs> but, that's uh, the best. That's finding the best open mic com- comedy. No, <laughs> that's an agenda that's bias because yeah. I'm a white man so, and yeah. I'm muscular or whatever, mm. you know. And, and with Raw, like, there was a couple of them where I should have gone through. And I'll tell you, the, the funniest one was the – not the last one, the one before. I was, um, they were calling out all the winners. There was five going through. And everyone that had gone up were horrible. And everyone's going, you're going through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had my hat like this. I was in the corner of the room. And yet had to walk into the middle and walk up the centre to get to the stage. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, there's one more that's got to be me. Not out of arrogance, but just out of odds. Because yeah, it's yeah. like, well, they got no laughs and I lit the room up. Okay, yeah. well, obviously I'm going through this to find the best comedian. And I started walking to the stage and I'm at the back and I'm about to turn to walk up the centre and I'm turning my hat like this because I was on stage like this. And as I've turned the corner, they've gone, and going through is... Melissa, da, 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 da. and I've just <laughs> sat down on the first chair, like, <laughs> and was timed it right, where yeah. no one knew yeah. that I was walking up there to accept the. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. One more step, and I would have looked like a dickhead. <laughs> no, man, that's um, cool. But yeah, that's the festival. But I mean, everyone's doing it, so I yeah, can get ten people to listen to you every night. Um, there's a gig every night. Mm-hmm. If you can do spots, do spots. It just has a bad taste. I've been to Montreal twice and, you know, that's curated and it's you've got to be picked to go there. Um, and they're not all the best comedians. I've seen some horrible acts in Montreal, you know, and I've seen some Aussie acts, um, namely the one who heckled me in my first, M- uh, my first gig, the MC, in Montreal and then watched it on Channel 10 and heard the canned laughter that wasn't in the room when I was standing in the room with the other owner of the Comics Lounge. We were like, and that laughter wasn't there. Yeah. I was in yeah. the room. I was standing right next to the camera. Oh, you've just canned laughter, this crap, to make you 
your act look good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I remember um, my first uh, raw set. I, your, I, I did my first raw set. I did it. Uh, yeah. I did it this. I did it uh, this year. Yeah. Uh, January or something. Uh, Sanjay was on before me, Sanjay Parapanathan, and he come on and he was like doing his pimp act. He was, he was, I don't know, he was wearing like a big jacket or something. And then um, he, he gets off stage <laughs> and towards the end of it, it fizzled out. He wasn't, he wasn't that uh, funny towards the end. And I just come on and I go, what's going on, you saucy motherfuckers? <laughs> 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 and there was a fucking kid in the front row so i just started crowd working i was like i was like why did your parents bring you and she's like there's a white there's a white lady it was like it's an education for her. oh shit <laughs> i'm like wrong move your 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 daughter's going to be 20 percent dumber after watching this show <laughs> Jesus. Oh man. And um so uh I did I did well. I did well. I'm pretty sure it um I didn't say I would say it would have been um close, but out of the male acts that were funny, I think I got the most laughs. But um they let a dude go through that bomb. Yeah, yeah, there's they've got an agenda and a look. Yeah. Um I didn't do it, but there was one, like, probably the third year I should have done it or whatever, I didn't. And I went there, I had business, they made business cards for me and I was handing them out to newer comedians saying, come to the workshops. Um, it's a safer space for you, you know, you can learn, get up if you want to or don't. And a big comedian now, a really big comedian who was on his way up was judging and he was over my right shoulder. I was there with a friend, I think. And um, they called out the winners. And I'm just like, what? And I just turned around and looked at him. And he's just gone, sorry, Flemo. And he's pointed at the women next to him. Oh, he's like, oh, I, have, I have to do what they want. Like, I'm yeah. here to do a role. And, it was yeah. just, and I gave him the filthiest look like, you sell out. Yuck. Is it yeah. really that worth it? You know, and he's a big star on TV now, but it's like, still, you've got to look in the mirror someday and go, oh, yeah, I've, I'm, you've got to look in your own eyes and go, yeah, I was really cool with what I did to get here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's I'm, interesting. And, yeah, I'm Roll. different that way where it's like, I'll, I'll get to wherever I'm supposed to go. It's hard to know where you're going to go or where you're going to get in comedy because I'm not going to bow down to their style. Or they, you know, I'm not going to take out. As I said, yeah. I'm not going to remove all the funny bits out of my set to be like that style. Yeah, it's very wordy and and whatever. I'm not bagging them out as much, but yeah, um, yeah, it just doesn't matter. We all know comics that, that aren't big, but are that much funnier and better acts. It's know? true. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've actually got cut of myself after um, the raw set that I did because. Uh, I went out and I did material on you that worked. And I actually got pissed off that I was like, why didn't I just treat this like another gig that I was trying to improve on my stuff? Why did I just go do it? I, I felt like I lost a gig that day. I had yeah. a whole, I'm like, I could try some new shit, you know? And why did I do old shit that I knew worked? Yeah, I, I tell people in the workshops, like, treat Roar as, a, as another gig. Just always sign up because you've got a gig and there might yeah. be a good crowd. Um, but when I did, I remember there was a dude, Johnny AU, who was a cool, he's a cool dude, and he quit comedy because he couldn't handle the stress. <laughs> I remember he would be pacing up and down like, oh, my God, oh, my God. Like it, your life depends on this. Like my career depends on winning and getting through Yeah, like everything. And... I think after one of the rules, the last rule, the one where I turned my hat, he just quit because it was like, he, he's having panic attacks and an, he's going to have an aneurysm <laughs> worrying about it. Just, 
you know, treat it like your own gig. And the good thing these days is when you're doing stuff like this, you know, and you're cluey with social media and you're cluey with videoing and different things, this is where you find your your niche. You find, like, a, I'm finding a, an audience with my videos. It's growing um, slowly but surely, but they get my humour. I'm unfiltered. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm... I'm not holding back. I can <laughs> so proud of this. Uh, in one of the new episodes, there's um, the backstory of this show is there's a Nigerian guy and his future wife's like 40 years older than him. Yeah. And she's just a bitch. And he's talking to his mum on the phone, but they didn't put subtitles for him for the conversation. Yeah. Because after he hangs up, she goes, what did your mother say? Because they're trying to get her blessing. He goes, oh, I told her that we are coming over, blah, blah, blah. But I changed the subtitles and I put in the most offensive shit you could ever. But it's not me. It's him talking to his mum. It's like, hey, mummy. Yo, yo, mammy, what's happening? It's like, uh, I'm bringing that fat bitch over. It's like, fuck me. Do you really have to bring that mould warehouse and stuff like that? <laughs> and it's like, you know, word up my N-word. See you soon. <laughs> Like that's the mother saying it to him, and in its context, it's fine. It's not. I'm not being disrespectful or offensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. But everyone who loves that, oh, cool. Well, we've got a connection. Yeah. You get me. You get me. All right. I'm. I'm saying some of the worst shit you could say about people in these videos, but in a funny way. But yeah. They these people that have been adding me and the people that are sending me messages going, "Thank you. I needed that laugh. You are so fun." Blah 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 blah. Well, I've got a connection with you. So when I do a gig, they're going to enjoy what comes out. For sure, for sure. Yeah, Having it as long as I'm authentic. So that's the route to take. I mean, doing podcasts and unfortunately with this quarantine, everyone's doing a podcast. Like, I want to start doing mine again, but I feel like oh, I don't want to be one of them. Although I've got 17 already, but, you keep know. You, bro. Um, Dude, keep yeah. doing. You're, you're smashing this uh, online game, man. You've been, for people that don't know, uh, uh, Flemo's been uh, reviewing, uh, fuck, what's it called? Uh, originally was Married at First Sight was the first show. And I, yeah. mean, I just committed it, I think, in January because I'm going to do stuff. And someone said to me, you should review a reality show and just roast it. Um, and I said, all right, I'm going to do this. And then I started and I, I did every episode. I kept my word, which is important to myself, yeah. to not just quit. And there were points where I wanted to quit because the shows are just just horrible shows. Reality TV sucks. Then I knew the new one. I got this before the 90 days, 90 day fiance. And I picked it up, I think, after about five episodes because I was trying to watch the first heap and it was just killing me. I thought I'll just pick it up wherever it started wherever yeah. it's at now yeah. uh, and it wasn't actually i was a few episodes behind and i imagine that i do three a week and yeah. it just takes a, a week to do um well, some people but, wouldn't be able to watch the um the actual thing because they haven't bought it so they'd type it in on on youtube and then you would come up but you're more entertaining than the show is so they would just consistently watch you people don't want to watch a show yeah yeah some of the reviewers actually go like, all it is is them talking to camera going, and then Michael came out and Michael said, uh, I don't love you anymore. And then Lisa said, well, I do love you and I'm not letting you leave. Blah, 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 blah. And they're just saying what literally happened, whereas I'm cutting in video clips from movies and, yeah. like, like, and the good thing with that, too, is some of the video clips have become, like, I keep bringing them back each episode. Like, if someone says something stupid articulates a word wrong like this lady yolanda from uh vegas black lady she's, she's like no i asked him ak instead of a s yeah. i keep asking him and i'm like ah, ah. now i'm pretty sure it's ask and I, like i i look for little things like that yeah. and i play the song which used to be on hey hey it's saturday when jackie mcdonald would say something stupid they just play this song folks i don't where i come from yeah. yeah. And I just play that. It's a running punchline. 
Uh, yeah. If anyone says, hey, let's go do it, I cut in the clip from um, Starsky and Hutch. Do it. Do it. <laughs> like, it's just little things yeah. where they yeah. become regularly funny and timing and editing, all that stuff. But, you know, it's it's clocked over to 205, I think, subscribers now. And they're yeah. real. I haven't bought any of them. Um, a lot of people do that. Even yeah. these big YouTubers, I've gone through their YouTubes and their Instagrams. They might have 50,000 followers, but 30,000 of them are paid. There's like 30, Nigeria. 30 likes on yeah. their photos, 50,000 followers. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, hang on. Yeah. And, and I've gone through, you know, their mates, a lot of our YouTubers here, and I've gone through and they've got the same followers. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's the same. They've paid the same person to yeah. like all their pages and stuff like that. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to fall in it because that's an easy trick. You can sit there and I can bump it up by a few hundred, which makes you look bigger. And then people go, oh, I'm going to like it too. Well, nah, the, I want to know what the truth is. I want to know what's real and I'm going to stick to it. The trick with YouTube is people just get the – because you need a 1,000 uh, subscribers to be making money. So people just start on a 1,000. They buy yeah. a thousand, which is not dumb. It's very smart. Like if you did that, you'd probably be making money right now. But now I'm getting copyright claimed <laughs> 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 on everything. <laughs> yeah, but you might be making copyright claims. But you put out like a, a, a two minute video of just yeah, I'm dealing with COVID, blah blah blah, and then on that video you get um, money. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. It yeah, there is something. I think it, well, it is starting to snowball. And if I get onto the right show, once yeah. this one's done, I'm going to have to do some things until the next show starts because they're pushed back. I was about to do Farmer Wants a Wife. Yeah. Uh, and they've stopped, stopped that for some reason. They've pushed it back. See, that'll be good for the Australian market. Yeah. Um, the Bachelor US, there was one, a new one that's supposed to start. You know, so if I'm doing two at once from different regions, at least yeah. the fan base will go up or the following will go up and then, yeah, oh, yeah. you know. Well, but, people, people are still going, um, still making their, their review money. People that review politics, they're just, they're, yeah. they, they watch a Trump clip or they watch a this clip and then they get it, they cut it up, they break it down, blah, 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 and they get a million views on it. You're like, this will never end. It's not like a TV show. Like, it won't stop. But there are so many TV shows that you can just do any and everyone would be like, you know, it's great. So you're, you're doing well, man. You're smashing it. Yeah. And like I said, I know how to edit now. And I know how to, I know how to do all those things, which I didn't yeah. know at the start. And that was the goal. Like, at, the, at least I'm going to know how to do, I'm going to have better skills. Um and, I mean, I've got to look at – I've been looking at doing politi like different interviews. Yes, yes, where I yes. See him and, it's, and, you know, this dude's just lying through his teeth and I'm like, yeah. oh, I might start breaking down because yeah. they're quicker. So I can pump one out a day and it's not like doing my head in. Like, like I said, the process for doing this episode, I think I downloaded it yesterday. Like last week's one, like I said, was a two-and-a-half, three-hour one. I downloaded it edit it a little bit, then the next day try to watch a little bit more and cut blank bits out that I'm not going to use, then edit it. And then I crack the shits and just get rid of chunks. Because I'm like, oh, God. And then sometimes I'm just left with what I've left with because of my temper. And I'm like, which is good because it's like, okay, I've got to make this funny. There's yeah. nothing funny about what they said. How do I make that? And so there's all these different comedy skills that are coming into play. It, Funny editing. Um, yeah, sure. In the last one, I edited stuff where <laughs> this guy's, um, well, it might have been the one before, where he, he's got a history of assault. He's been in prison. And I'm making it out like he was glad to be in prison. So I edited in a prison scene where he's like, you know, dropping the soap. But he's actually, so with his words, I'm making it, you know, and I'm, I'm really proud of it. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. proud yeah. of something. So I'm keeping it in my mind. Remember that word that he said he was proud of something. When he says something else, I can chuck, cut out, not proud of it, cut out the not and put proud in. But, 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 but little things like that where I'm being 
being a smart ass, basically. <laughs> I'm loving it. That's good, man. You you found um, you know, you're calling, man. You found something that you like doing and that uh, is going to get you an audience. And I think if you continue in that direction, by the end of, but I reckon by next year you'll be someone that people are looking up to in in the Australian comedy world that they want at every show because you're going to have such a following and people realize how genuine you are. They're going to go to, I don't know, Sydney, Sydney comedy club or Sydney comedy store is going to call you up and say, Hey, we want Flemo down. And they're going to actually yeah. hunt you because of, you know, you're able to bring in audiences and the married at first sight thing. You've made yourself, let's, I reckon a hundred people subscribe to you from that or maybe a hundred. Yeah, yeah. 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 Probably 150, I think from that. Yeah, but a thousand watched you, two thousand watched you. Yeah. So two thousand people in Australia already know that you're funny. Well, the last seven or eight videos from that show hit a thousand, and a couple like one or one and a half thousand. I think one hit two and a half thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You videos. do. Yeah. yeah, it's um, and it's a funny thing too, which I'm still working out is, like you put one out. Let's say I put one out today for next this week's episode. I've got five days for it to sit there. It won't get many views. But if I release it on the night before the next episode, like I did this week, it went boom. And I'm like, it makes no sense. It's because people want to watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People wanted to and, watch it. So they're fucking, yeah. yeah. And, and maths was the same. I was like, hang on, people have... I put, I put it out on the Sunday morning before the show starts because they'd get a few days off from that show. Um, Wednesday to Sunday, I put it out. And I'm like, oh god, I'm fucked up. I put it out too late. Boom, and it's yeah. like a, one and a half thousand views. I'm like, what? <laughs> that shouldn't have happened. <laughs> okay, can't yeah. time it. Don't know when. Just put it out there, and if it does, it does. Doesn't it? Doesn't. Who cares? Don't even look at it. Just reply to the comments. Yeah, thank people for their comment and appreciate it, and a bit of banter, and uh, that's yeah. all you can do. That's another good thing that that um. I think we all do. That's what we preach to each other in this scene. We're like, if someone puts a comment, reply to it. Always reply to it. Yeah. And that, if that brings engagement and brings more people to your to your um, to your well, shop front. And, your and it, front. it shows it shows respect and gratitude for people. You know, with with music. When I was in Europe on tour with the last album, after a gig, you know, I'd be queue, there'd be a queue of you know, thousands of hot women just there to get my photo. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but there'd be a queue of, you know, fans or whatever. And they'd come up and I'd sign the album or and get a photo with them. But that was the time for me to say thank you. They'd be like, yeah. thank you for coming to our country or whatever. Um, I'd be like, no, thank you. One, this stuff's from here and here. Like it's from this guy and you like it. So we've got a connection now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You you've connected with what comes from me, out of me. So thank you. I couldn't be in your country if you didn't like me. So this is a time for me to go on tour and say thank you. I got to live. A little kid got to live his dream. Yeah. And and I'm taking that same approach. You know, there's people in my comment section that comment on every video, and they got into me from maths, and I've brought them into this other show. So I kind of. And same in music with Pegasus. We've got fans from the early days who become close friends with the band because they were the first fans. So I've got that same feeling with these people. It's like, oh, you're my homie because you were there from day one supporting me. Yeah. And it's a very similar music mentality for me. I reckon you can see the fans, those Pegasus fans. I still reckon they'll, they'll come over. And once they hear about it, once you start making moves, Rolling Stones magazine writes a... Uh, a nice <laughs> thing about yeah. Well, I reckon well, there's there is a point like with the comedy. There was a point where it was like, I oh, don't don't market to them yet because you're not good enough, and you don't want people coming to see you when you suck because then they're going to go, oh, we gave them a chance, and it might be four or five years later that you're good enough, but they're like, nah, you burnt me five years ago. Yeah, you still got that stench on you. So with the music, there'll be a move. I don't know. It'll show itself eventually where I'll hit them, and uh, yeah. 
Slow, man. I, I, I Get really, them on board. You'll uh, you'll find like a, I don't know, just a chance, an opportunity. Maybe hosting. Maybe you can host like one of these death metal events. That would be yeah. Cheap. There's ten minutes. That's, that's one one thing I am doing with these videos is I'm I'm mindful that I'm working on my hosting skills, like hosting the camera. Yeah. Um, when I went back to Pegasus in 09 or 08, I was actually, I wasn't supposed to join the band. I was only going there because I was acting at the time in TV and shit. Um, I was only supposed to go back to the band as a host for a TV show that was coming out. I was supposed to be the host. The band were the backup for, it was a guitar show. Yeah. Um, like Guitar Hero, but with real guitarists battling against each other and I was supposed to host it and then sing a song with the band at the end of the show. So I started rehearsing with them just to get my yeah, voice yeah. back to where it needed to be. Um, so I definitely do see, I mean, even with Married at First Sight, I'm like, well, if I can say with the next season or by the next season, I'll be even better at everything. If I can do a cleaner cut, not so much cleaner material, but a real clean cut of it, yeah. There's no reason I couldn't have my own show at 11 o'clock when the kids are in bed roasting yep. the maths people, you know? Yeah. Or on Foxtel where I'm roasting reality yep. TV shows. Those things are sort of in my mind. I'm like, I would, cool, I would that. Say stick to YouTube, man, because as soon as you get someone or a, uh, a network that's behind you that's still trying to push, they're always trying to push an agenda. Yeah. That's, that's, that's well, what I'm scared. When it comes to TV, that's why I'll never give in to TV. I'll just say so I could, I'm just thinking I could probably roast the Big Bash cricket or something like that. Oh, man, that'd be so good. Exactly. And and with your name, you could get your brother to share it. You would get heaps of views, man. Yeah. Oh, mate, he would probably go, can you please not speak about these cricketers like that? He's like that. With that's me. better. That's better. You get the photo of him saying it and you put that online. I'll get his message going, can you please stop so? Because I remember he sent me a message on, or he told me, I haven't seen him in freaking ages. He goes, oh, I had to unfollow you off Twitter because um, you were saying offensive things, jokes and stuff. And I've got a lot of kids following me. I'm like, oh, fuck off, faggot. <laughs> you suck. You're weak as piss, mate. <laughs> tell me to do it. <laughs> Give me a head, but but yeah, I'll, if I can work out a way to roast, yeah, roast the cricket each week, do my recap. Yeah, yeah that's a good no idea. That. No one is going out and saying this guy's shit. This guy's good. This I used to do that with the soccer teams. I used to I used to roast. I used to do like um, three minutes of just going off at. Um, okay, let's look at the let's look at the match. Okay, this guy was fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> What I could do is go after the commentators too, as well. Oh, but man. Just, but go after him, like where it becomes a, a ridiculous yeah. hate crime. <laughs> you know who does that? Red Bar? Have you seen Red Bar? I've, I think I might have seen one thing or I've heard of Red Bar. Man, this guy roasts every single comic. Every single one of them. He roasts, like he'll go off at um, Andrew Santino. He'll go off at um, Joey Diaz doing Xanax. He will. Yep, yeah, that's he what will, I heard about him. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. I think Joey Diaz talked about it. He actually looked at yeah. um, a reply, but he'll go out. She let my dog in. Oh, just make sure your dog doesn't jump on your pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is my lucky. This is my podcasting shirt, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, do they does it um do they have a, like a, a men's range as well? No, no, it's <laughs> trans women. I love that nighty. It looks beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's uh, uh what, what we're doing. I I think I think there's a big hole in the market, man, for entertainment on sports. I I've seen um I I'd have put that Alessio and uh and Joel Pierce. Yeah. They started a month ago, a month and a half ago, maybe like two weeks before COVID, and they're up to like a thousand likes already. They just put out memes, meme after meme after meme, oh, wicked. just destroying each footballer 
and and everyone is like even the people that are writing hateful stuff they're replying they're like we'd love you to come on the show call up blah right. blah they just keep slamming every single thing and um I think I think that is is great. It does have a um, backlash to it, but when you get someone on something that's like, I don't know, it's, it's crude, but it's so true that it's funny. And they'll find, find their groove as well. Yeah, like you'll just get funnier at doing it. And no, don't go there. That's not worth it. This yeah. is how to, you know. And if people are talking about you. I remember Skid Row, uh, the heavy metal band. Um, they were yeah. huge in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Um, we were on tour with them back in 2009. And uh, one of them on the plane, I was talking to Rachel Bolan, I think, and he said, um, no publicity is bad publicity. Remember that? Because unless it's in the obituary, it's all good. <laughs> So whether wow. they're talking shit or whether they're praising you, it's good because they're talking. Yeah. I'll never forget that, yeah. Yeah, so, well, online it's it, 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 it amplifies, man, because you can get a word out instantly. Like it's, it's so quick. So many people, if you think about how many people, like how many people learned about the virus, it was instant. It was in a day. Yeah. It was in a day. Bang, 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 bang. Facebook, YouTube, blah, blah, blah. Everything, bang. Everyone's found out about it. Like, no one right now doesn't know about COVID. No, so, exactly. But you can't say that about anything else. Like, maybe, like, you know what I mean? Like, everyone knows about everything, uh, like, nothing else. But they all know about COVID. I mean, even AIDS is pissed off with it. <laughs> <laughs> What about me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. No one cares about AIDS anymore. Right. I, I've, been, I've been trying to get it. <laughs> no, one, no one will come in my eye. I've even dressed up like Dean Laidley the other night. I'm like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, it's been an hour and a half, man. Uh, it's been a great talk. Uh, uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, you've been awesome, man. Um, I've done two podcasts. Oh, pleasure, bro. My brain's pretty fried. I can't, I can't even think. <laughs> <laughs> been podcasting for like two and a half hours. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on, um, guys. Uh, Justin Fleming, follow him. Check out his videos. They're very funny. I had my mum on just a bit earlier before we started, and she watches the videos too. So uh, definitely someone to watch. Um, if you're if you're a fan of Married at First Sight or reality TV in general, this man is slowly becoming the king of it, and yeah, great person to watch. Puts in the work too. They're not they're not easy to make. So check it out. Give him a follow. No, thank thank you, bro. I appreciate uh, appreciate chatting to you. It's good to good to see your head in your beautiful nighty. <laughs> Edit time, man. Edit time. All right. Thanks for that. Thanks. See you guys. See ya.